Hey there. If you have already heard this, please skip forward. This is the intro description to the video parts for a page on my website. The page you are likely viewing this on will teach the basics of how to read the different types of plots and seismic charts people use. If there is anything I can add or any mistakes to be corrected, please do not hesitate to contact me. To aid people who have a harder time reading or just those who would rather watch a video, I am adding video versions to the different sections on my read, spectrogram, seismic plots, and more page, which resides under the how to drop down menu on my website. If you are viewing this on YouTube, please scroll to the description box below and click the link to the page. Here we have how to read web recorders, spectrograms, and seismic plots, among a few other things. And you can tell this is on my website, monitorsize.weebly.com. Go to the how to drop down menu and click this right here read spectrograms, seismic plots, and more. That is the page we are currently on. The following sections of this page are how to read online web recorders and helicorders, how to read spectrograms, how to read waveform seismogram plots, how to read frequency spectra analysis plots, and amplitude scaling and amplitude clipping. This will be a simple yet detailed guide on how to read the online seismic charts, also called web recorders, along with how to read spectrograms, seismogram plots, and frequency spectra analysis plots. Just a heads up. This will not teach you how to interpret the specific events shown. I will try to give a brief explanation as to what you are seeing, but the whole purpose of this is to get you accommodated with how to read the different types of seismic analysis options. Not only can you learn this from myself, but you can also learn it partly by looking at chart labels and doing some research for yourself. For some reason, many people forget to read chart labels and get deceived as to how long or how large the events were, all because they didn't look at chart labels. Now, a seismograph is another term for a seismic instrument, a seismometer. Seismic instruments can read, or excuse me, can record distant and local vibrations and can detect vibrations 50,000 to 100,000 times smaller than what humans can feel. For example, some short period instruments and broadband instruments as well can record extremely small earthquakes registering at a negative magnitude in retrospect. About a magnitude 2.5 or so and above can be felt by humans depending on the depth and the type of rock the seismic waves travel through and, of course, the sensitivity of the person in question. A seismogram is a line that is generated by a webicorder or helicorder recorded by a seismic instrument, seismometer, seismograph. I used to use the word seismograph in regards to a webicorder or helicorder, even though the word seismograph does make a lot of sense since they literally are graphs. For some reason, webicorder or helicorder is the proper term. Now, here's some terminology I want you guys to know. Seismograph is the same thing as a seismometer, a seismic instrument that can record both, both excuse me, horizontal and vertical ground motion. A helicorder, which is also called a webicorder when it is online, is a digital graph or chart that allows seismograms to be seen. A typical 24-hour helicorder image will contain 48 lines, also known as seismograms, with 30 minutes allotted per seismogram. Now a seismogram is a line of data that is produced by a seismograph. Before technology advanced, seismograms used to be recorded on drum recorders with pen and ink. I'm sure that you have seen some drum recorders at least once before in a movie or on TV. Drum recorders are basically useless now and pretty much are only for museum visits. Waveforms. Waveforms are what make up a seismic trace, a seismogram. If you zoom in far enough to any seismogram, you will notice all of them are made up of waveforms. It's what they're made up of, guys. The vast majority of the time, online seismograms cannot show detailed waveforms due to the long period of time per line, per seismogram, and the size of the image. You pretty much have to download seismic data and review it in seismic analysis software. This website I've created can help you do that. Email me or go to the proper pages. I am always here if you ever need help, and, do, and doing these things are much easier, guys, much easier than you would want to believe, or others would want you to believe. Now, a spectrogram. During seismic analysis, you will notice one of the options commonly given is the ability to review the data via a spectrogram. Now, spectrograms are easy to read, but are in no way more important than waveforms. For example, when determining the epicenter of an earthquake, the main thing you first do is judge the space between the P wave arrival and the S wave arrival. You cannot do that solely with spectrograms. But if you analyze data with frequency spectra plots, spectrograms, and seismograms, you will not fail. Spectrograms are simple in that they always record frequency vertically, 
time period horizontally, and the color range that you see is power. All seismic spectrograms are generated from the seismic instrument it was generated from. There is no such thing as an actual seismic spectrometer at all. Well, at least I haven't run across one yet with UNAVCO, CBO, or other organizations, but no, they do not have them because the spectrograms are automatically generated from the seismic station it came from. Now, there is such a thing as a spectrometer that generates spectrograms for fields that aren't even related to seismology. However, as just stated, seismic spectrograms that record frequency and time period are always generated by a seismic station, possibly even strain meters too. But even that is a little iffy because strain meters detect the deformation of the earth in the borehole. Spectra plots. Another option used by seismologists is the frequency spectra analysis tool, which is called spectra in the seismic program swarm. These spectra plots are important. Now this is kind of like what would happen if a spectrogram and a seismogram plot had a baby. On a more serious note, they are different than seismograms or spectrograms. You know how seismograms record amplitude vertically and time period horizontally, and how spectrograms record frequency vertically, time period horizontally, and the color range is power? Well, spectral analysis shows no time period at all, which means for whatever time period you have selected in the previous windows, especially in the program swarm, spectral analysis will record power vertically and frequency horizontally. The seismic program swarm contains all three analysis options. Spectra plots are important in that you can see the strongest frequencies of any earthquake, tremor, or surface event. That is because all seismic instruments detect all vibrations received. How to read online webicorders and helicorders. In this example, I would use Seismic Network's WI online webicorders for Yellowstone Supervolcano. But for YMC, I did generate my own helicorders. Again, I say to all those who mostly use the online webicorders that most seismograms these days are too small and constrained by pixels to discover the true origins of any event. For example, the U of U webicorders, University of Utah, are constrained by pixels on an image and contain 48 lines with 30 minutes per line. In retrospect, when you use swarm or waves to analyze the data, you can zoom in to almost one millisecond and use many different types of plots, including helicorders. If you truly want to understand the origin of any earthquake, among many other aspects of seismological analysis, you must analyze the data using seismic analysis tools. I currently check the online web recorders, and whenever I see anything of interest, I download the seismic data to use in Swarm or Waves, and then I pull up the live streaming data from Jamaseus if I need to. However, I use Swarm the most, and I use the online web recorders less than any other tool. Go to Seismic Software for the download links and some brief information. Want to learn how to use the software? Go to the how-to drop-down menu. Remember, with most online web recorders, the red marks are not earthquake marks. They are simply amplitudes that have been clipped. If an amplitude exceeds a certain preset amount, it is clipped. Every clipped amplitude is marked as red. Even surface noise can be clipped. I know that as a fact. Since that is how the Swarm program works, and the U of U uses a similar program, as do many different institutions. And no, the clipped data is not missing. Notice all amplitudes are there when checking the waveforms. I will show an example of this at the end of the page, and also at the end of the quote-unquote Use Swarm page in the How-To drop-down menu. The picture you see here is Station YMC, which resides in the northwest section of Yellowstone National Park, just outside the Caldera Rim. This day, August 24th, 2018, was actually a good day to use as an example. Real quick, a teleseism is a large distant earthquake that typically occurs above magnitude 5.0, over 800 kilometers or so from the seismic instrument that recorded it. For example, a seismic recording at Yellowstone of the deep Fiji 8.2 earthquake would be considered a teleseism. The teleseism shown above occurred in Peru. This one right here occurred in Peru and was a magnitude 7.1 at 609 kilometers in depth ever since the Kilauea eruption calmed in late 2018, which again started at the beginning of May 2018 and calmed around August 2018. The world has seen a large breakout in large earthquakes, but also large earthquake deep focus events just in the month or two after the uh, Kilauea eruptions calmed. In the month of August 2018, there were three major deep quake events, with two being considered deep focus. A magnitude 8.2 near Fiji, a 7.3 in Venezuela, and a 7.1 in Peru. 
that 8.2 and 7.1 were around 550 to 600 kilometers in depth, therefore dubbing them deep focus earthquakes. The regional earthquake, which is, which is this one right here, is an earthquake which is not local, but is not global as well. And it was a magnitude 4.3 that occurred in Colorado. And the local earthquake, you can see right here, is one that occurs somewhat near the seismograph in question. It is actually easy to tell what is a large global earthquake compared to a local event. The farther from the epicenter you are, the farther the P and S waves will be from each other. Notice the teleseism in the example here. See right when it appears solid red, you see that right there? Then calms down for about a minute and then solid red appears again. That shows a secondary increase in energy where the amplitudes were cut. See that right there? That is the P and S wave separations. Of course, you cannot really actually see the P and S wave arrival times since the time period is much too large within too small of an area. But that is an example on how people locate earthquakes through seismic analysis tools are required to do that. To accurately locate an earthquake to the latitude and longitude, which is something I have yet to be comfortable in doing, you must take three seismographs at the minimum and calculate the time difference between the P and S wave arrivals using the seismogram, which is also called waveform analysis. That is something you cannot do in any way unless you have seismic analysis software. Sorry, but that is the cold hard truth, but thank God downloading seismic data and adding it to analysis software is actually pretty easy. Now determining earthquake causes, locations, and magnitudes is a little harder. There's also something that confuses me even to this day. They are called shadow zones. Please Google P wave shadow zone and S wave shadow zone for additional research on this subject. Here we have station YPK, which is the easternmost seismic station in the WY network at Yellowstone. Well, one of them. They do have a few other ones, I believe YEE -E and YNE. They're a little bit more east, but YPK is basically one of the most easternmost stations at the park right on the border of the National Park line. So let's go down, you know it's YPK. All right, so I do have a few examples here. Now let's use this Webby quarter as the next example. Now again, the Alaska Volcano Observatory has a good explanation, and I do have a link down here, guys, if you wanna go see it, check it out. They do have a good explanation there as well in regards to how to read an online Webby quarter. With an online Webby quarter, which is what this chart is, you read it as a book from left to right, top to bottom. This Webby quarter shows a 24 hour period expressed by 48 lines with 30 minutes allotted for each line. Remember, each line is also called a seismogram. So technically you could say this chart contains 48 seismograms. One line would be one seismogram, two lines would be two seismograms, and so on and so forth. So for this example, there are three red circles. You notice them? The bottom two encircle the time zone type. The vertical numbers on the left are the times in Mountain Time, MDT or MST, and on the right is Universal Time Code, UTC. This can be different depending on network or location, so please always pay attention to chart labels first before you read the data. For example, since I live within the Pacific Time Zone, whenever I create heli quarters, it shows the time in Pacific Time on the left instead of mountain time like you see with the Yellowstone heli quarters. If you see a web quarter use GMT, such as the automatic Mount Rainier web quarters, it's the same thing as UTC, at least for the seismograms you will read. Need help understanding UTC since that's what seismologists use the most? Then please scroll down to this location right here and click, click here. I try to explain it as best as possible. Now I want you to notice something interesting. Although there are 48 lines, do you notice how there are only 24 numbers on each side? 24 numbers on this side and 24 numbers on this side, one per hour. Now it is easy to assume what will come next in the sequence when looking at each number. For example, it shows 1730, 1830, 1930, 2030. I'm pretty sure you can assume what fits in between those numbers since it is 30 minutes per line. Now notice the third smaller circle at the 730 MDT mark. Well, where that line starts is where 7.30 Mountain Time starts, right? That is also where 13.30 UTC starts as well. Sound confusing? It kind of is at first. Something that really helped me a great deal was the timing of local earthquakes. So let's say an, a 4.0 earthquake just occurred 15 miles west of YPK, the seismic station that I used for the example above. Since the travel time of that earthquake should not exceed 5 seconds or so, let's say 10 seconds max, to reach YPK, then you can use that as a guide. And not just that, you can use pretty much any major earthquake that occurred 
in the United States somewhere when you're looking at Yellowstone or something. And you can just look at the exact times and compare it to the time on the chart. And then that can help teach you the placement of the times in the different time zones. So what I kept, what I did is I just kept comparing local earthquake times that were confirmed by seismologists with the time that are arrived on the web recorder. I suggest that if you are having any trouble doing this, do that or email me or a professional. About the UNAVCO borehole instruments. Now seismographs simply record every single ground vibration, even 50,000 to 100,000 times smaller than what humans can feel. This means if you were standing still directly to a seismograph and you felt complete silence and peace, the seismograph next to you could still be detecting ground motion even from an earthquake that occurred 2,000 kilometers away. Woo! If you were to bend down and just barely tap the monitor, it would show as a very large spike. Since seismographs detect all vibrations, surface noise is a constant hassle for seismologists. This is why some seismic monitors are placed below ground, sometimes at 300 to 500 feet, some deeper, inside of a borehole. Now this is done to minimize surface interference. Borehole seismometers minimize surface noise greatly. Uh oh, found a typo, I'll fix that. But does it completely eliminate any and all possibilities of strong surface events appearing on the station? No, strong surface events are still possible. An example and info as to how and why that is still a possibility is shown in this video directly below. Please guys, click this button here to visit the video so you can utilize the parts section in the description box if you wish to skip to a part of interest because this video right here I made is pretty long, but it does contain some really good examples. Now that being said, it is still possible to see surface noise on a borehole. Depending on borehole depth, amplitude of the surface noise in question, distance from the surface noise and sensitivity. Yes, those factors do play a major part in surface noise appearing on borehole seismic instruments, but it must draw out something for you. Boreholes will never show surface noise, you know, like long drawn out surface noise from wind, storms, whatever. They will not. I'm talking about strong surface events caused by like one-time events. You know what I'm talking about? Sometimes the webby quarters make it hard to distinguish from surface noise and actual seismic events, even more so on surface stations. I tell you now, it is not that hard to tell the difference if you cross-correlate using seismic analysis software. If a true event occurs underground, it will propagate away from the source in a sort of circular distance pattern, just like a ripple in a pond. For example, when I first discovered this was on July 5th, 2018, when I was first studying the July 5th, 2018 West Thumb Rapid Fire event. Even the tiny micro-earthquakes, magnitude 0.0, .0 to 0 0.8, took only about 2 to 4 seconds to tra travel excuse me, 14 miles from YLT to YML, and appeared on multiple surrounding seismic stations. Now that is the opposite of what surface noise does. When surface noise occurs, it is pretty easy to tell since surface noise cannot travel 14 miles in 2 to 4 seconds. Well, unless the ground vibrations are from quarry blasts or some other type of extremely strong event. A great example are the surface vibrations created during an avalanche on Mount Rainier. Some strong avalanches can actually appear on seismic stations over 5 to 8 miles away. However, those are extremely easy to tell apart since a lot of the events there are composed of surface waves and the strength of the events drop much, much faster than if they were occurring underground. But we don't really have to worry about av avalanches excuse me, occurring at Yellowstone at all, guys. Remember, it all depends on the characteristics. But remember, if it only appears on just one station, it is most likely surface noise. But you never know. Steamboat geyser eruptions, since they have somewhat lost strength, only show on one station, YNM. Some of the negative magnitude earthquakes at Yellowstone also sometimes only show on one station, the closest station. However, usually for that to happen, the events need to be pretty shallow and extremely weak. That is why you should always analyze the event in question. For example, Yellowstone recently felt a negative magnitude 0.2 earthquake. Now, that is extremely tiny. This micro mini, as I like to call it, and many others, have been felt by these seismographs at Yellowstone. Surface noise in most cases will only show on the seismic station that was closest to it. Remember, however, the stronger the amplitude of the event, the farther the vibration will travel. It is all dependent on a multitude of factors. Usually, it is very easy to distinguish between actual seismic activity if you can view the waveforms in a small enough window. For example, it would be hard to tell the cause of any event just by looking at the online seismographs, U of U, MBMG, etc. 
or spectrograms, UNAVCO, Spectronet, since they contain too large of a time frame and do not give you the freedom to analyze it the way you need to. Waveform and frequency analysis with combined cross-correlation of two or three of the closest neighboring seismic stations is key in determining the difference between surface events and actual seismic events. Trust me, I know that sounded like a mouthful, but it is much easier than that, than what you think. Trust me. If an event occurs underground, it travels farther than if an event were to occur above ground. Of course, you know, unless a large nuclear bomb went off. The reason some people have avoided doing this is because they either do not know the possibilities exist, or they believe that it is very tedious, very hard work. Well, that is a lie. It may take a few days to get the hang of yes, but it really is not that hard once you get the hang of it. Right here is an image showing the placement of the seismograph codes for YMC. This is a random webby quarter showing the placement of each seismograph code. Network, station, location, and channel. But you can see it's in a different order. They can be in different order, but they usually are uh, look like this on the web recorder. Station, channel, network, and location code. The station codes above are very important, but are mainly used for locating stations and downloading seismic data. To understand why these codes are so important, please go to the How To drop-down menu and click Download Seismic Data. Now that I have showed you how to read webby quarters, heli quarters, I will now show you how to read a spectrogram plot. So we're done with this video. Please scroll down and if you want to continue the video parts instead of reading this page, just scroll down and click the next video you see, which will be right under the title that says how to read spectrogram plot.